we have been studying in Philemon. <laughs> the word Philippians was right on the end of my tongue, and I, I had to struggle to say the right word. And actually, look at my notes. Don't you love that your pastor is not perfect? He proves it to you over and over again, doesn't he? Sin has definitely affected my brain. We are in Philemon, and we're going to look at verses 19 through 25 this morning. This is a letter all about forgiveness. There is not great, deep theology here. This is a story written by Paul underneath the power of the Holy Spirit. It comes straight from God. Paul is used of the Holy Spirit to write these things down. And what's so amazing about our Bible is only God could have written it. There's no way that man could have written it. And that's why you can't go through the Bible and show me errors. If man writes it, there are errors. So if I take other writings that people turn to and lean upon for their religion, huge problems. And they can be pointed out, and it's obvious. Things like the Book of Mormons. You know, the Book of Mormons is, is written, and while they use our regular Bible, they also use their writings. And it's all about Jesus' interaction with people in America. That's really what the Book of Mormons is. And in the Book of Mormons, they talk about these cities and these different places that were supposed to be here, down in Florida, up in New York, different places like that. And when they go dig those places up, there was never been a city there. Whereas when you read the Word of God, the Bible, guess what? Uh, you have a very famous story about a man that worked for Exxon Mobil that read in the Bible about Moses when he was a baby, and they used pitch on that uh, little bassinet, if you will, that his mom put him in, and they used pitch to make it waterproof. And he said, where well, there's pitch, there's oil. And he decided to go out in that location and go dig and drill for oil. And guess what they found? Well, the, at that point in time, the world's largest supply of oil. When the Bible says something, it's true. And they dig up where Sodom and Gomorrah was, and they find a city that was horribly scorched by fire. Amazing truths in the Bible. Only God could have done it. And, and God uses Paul's personality. We see it here. We see this story. It's a true story. And yet at the same time, as we go through it, there's not a lot of great theology, mainly because Philemon is a believer. He's a strong believer, and he knows the theology. So instead of commanding Philemon to do stuff, Paul pulls at his heartstrings. And as we go through here, you can see this happening in amazing ways. This book that he writes is only 25 verses long. The story is, as we've gone through it, Onesimus is a slave of Philemon. Philemon is a man that is wealthy. And it's interesting that we talk about Philemon being wealthy because in our Sunday school, we've been talking about rich people and how it's hard for them to become believers. We talk about what David meant for uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to go to heaven. We talk about what that meant even in Sunday school. And a lot of what we've been studying has simply been rich men are tied to this world and so it's very hard for them to get rid of that and become a believer. Yet here we have a rich man <laughs> who is a strong believer. So can a rich man be a believer? Absolutely, 100%. Here's Philemon. He has slaves, he has a big house, and in his house he has the church. Onesimus is Philemon's slave, and Philemon is a good slave owner. And Onesimus wants his freedom. Onesimus steals from Philemon so that he can get somewhere. And he runs away. And as we mentioned, his uh, a slave back in those days was worth 500 days wages. That would be like $100,000 to us today, somewhere in that range. He runs away, he's worth that much, plus he steals stuff. How much would that have been? I don't know. But Philemon may have 
run away, and the total value of everything that he ran away with may have been $200,000, $250,000. And he goes to Rome, which is the big city, and he tries to hide. And God makes sure that Philemon ends up in the presence of Paul. <laughs> Paul, I don't know how it happened, it doesn't tell us, but Paul is in jail, and he meets Onesimus, and he leads Onesimus to the Lord, and Onesimus has a change of heart, and he hears the story, Onesimus uh, must have confessed and told Paul what had happened, and lo and behold, when he tells Paul what had happened, he talks about a friend of Paul's, <laughs> who is Philemon. Paul led Philemon to the Lord, and Philemon begins to be useful to Paul. He's helping Paul in the ministry. But Paul knows something. I can't keep Philemon here. It's not like they had, you know, uh, WhatsApp or Skype. They couldn't just call uh, Philemon up on the phone and say, Hey, Philemon, look who I have with me. <laughs> it's hard to communicate in those days. So Paul writes this letter right here. He gives it to Onesimus. He says, go back and see Philemon. Boy, that's a difficult thing to do, isn't it? Imagine being Onesimus. Running away like that, if you get caught, many, many, many times is your death. Why? Because you can't repay what you did. So lo and behold, one day, Onesimus shows up at Philemon's doorstep <laughs> with a letter from Paul. And the whole letter is about forgiveness. We've learned a lot of interesting points from this for us today, haven't we? We've learned, one, that forgiveness is a promise. A promise to what? Never take revenge. And by the way, if you refuse to forgive, it almost always ends up in vengeance. You take it out on someone else. Forgiveness is holding no anger, no hatred, no bitterness. And really it's saying, I won't bring it up to you again. You know, I have seen people say they've forgiven. And in the moment something goes south, then they bring it up again. Well, yeah, I might have done that to you, but remember what you did to me? 20 years ago? <laughs> it's not forgiveness, is it? We learn that God forgives. We learn that Christ forgives. And by the way, we just took communion, and it was remembering what Christ did for us on the cross. His blood was shed. It covers all of our sins. It covers a multitude of sins. And every time we sin, he forgives us if you're a believer. Be willing to forgive. So our outline is as follows. Verses 4 through 7, we saw the character of one who forgives. Onesimus had amazing Christian character. Verses 8 through 18, last week we saw the action of one who forgives. The actions are reception. He received them back. Restoration. Remember, Paul was asking him to restore him back into your household. And it wasn't asking to be restored as a servant, by the way, right? <laughs> restore him as a brother. He's a believer now. And then we talked about restitution. If you were going to ask for forgiveness, which Onesimus certainly must be doing, he shows up there, he's asking for forgiveness, there must be restitution. Can Onesimus hope to ever pay back that $200,000 or whatever it's worth in today's standards, quarter of a million dollars? Absolutely not. He can't pay it back. So Paul does address that in verse 18, where it says, If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. If he owes you anything, put it on my account. I will take care of whatever he owes you. So now, we're going to get to verses 19 through 25, the motivations for forgiveness. Why should 
I forgive. Now, we've already covered some of these, right? One of the greatest tragedies you can do to yourself is to be unforgiving because one of the greatest things that happens when you don't forgive someone is they just keep you under the, your, their thumb. They hurt you, they wronged you, and it hurts, and you're unwilling to forgive, and every time you think about it, guess what? You, you just open those wounds again, and they have that power over you still. And in many times, it's over someone that's already dead and gone and, and, and moved on. And yet you think about them, and they just grind on you some more. They're, they're winning battles, <coughs> physical battles, after they've passed away. Don't allow that to happen to yourself. Move on. But let's move on to number one. Why should I forgive? Verse number 19. Recognize that I owe a debt I can't pay. I owe a debt I can't pay. Paul says in verse 19, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. So here's Paul. Remember, Paul, I believe, and again, this is just based off of what I believe the Bible says, I think because of the way Paul was introduced to Christ, which was a bright light, and then he was blinded for a couple of days, right? I believe Paul has a poor eyesight from that occasion. And then Paul asks three times that that thorn would be removed from his flesh. He even calls it a demon that's buffeting his body. He wants to be able to see good again. He can't see good. And it was never able to recover that. He, he, he uh, accepted that, by the way, after he asked for it for three times to be removed. He said, well, that's just something God's not going to do for me. So I had poor eyesight. So when Paul writes a letter, he doesn't write it himself. He tells someone what to write down. But usually at the end, then Paul will kind of sign his signature to it, if you will. Which usually happens at the beginning of the letter. But here we go. This is one of the very interesting letters that Paul writes because here in verse number 19, he says, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. From here to the end of the letter, Paul writes. I can imagine getting this document and there's probably this beautiful handwriting for the whole thing. And then all of a sudden, in great big letters, Paul finishes it off. He does it because he wants Philemon to understand some very important points. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. This tells me that Paul must have had a little bit of money stored up. Remember, Paul never was really asking for money from anybody. He didn't want to be indebted to any churches. He didn't want to be indebted to any people. Paul went out and worked in the ministry, and, and he was a, a, a tent maker, which I believe means he, he worked with cement, and he worked with some leather, and, and he just worked with his hands, and he made his own way when he was there at those places. That way they, were, they, they couldn't say, well, Paul is just here to make money. It's hard for people to say that I'm here to make money. <laughs> okay? There are pastors that are in it for that. And you can see them many times. They come in, and it's a small church, it's a small congregation, and they're like, after they've already been introduced to the congregation and get started, they still have their resumes out all over the place because they're looking for the next place that they can get more money from. That happens. Paul did not want to be indebted that way. So he worked his own way. But somewhere along the lines... He's either made money on his own, or we learn a couple of times that there's some churches that send him money. You know, he's in jail. He had some needs. It was hard for him to make money. So he must have had built up a little bit of money. Because he says, in verse 18, put it on my account. And here he says, I will pay it. He must have had the 500 denarii, plus whatever was stolen. I will take care of it for you. And then he does this. Here's the tugging at the heartstrings. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. 
Remember something, Philemon. I led you to the Lord. You owe me your soul. Philemon might owe you a little bit of money. I have the money. I'll give it to you. But remember, spiritual things are way more important than physical things. Being tied to this world will do nothing but just hold you down. And when you get to heaven, you're going to be sad that you allowed everything in this world to dictate your life. Remember, you owe me a spiritual debt. I took a little a moment, if you will, and I thought about a couple of things as I thought about this. There are people in my life that I owe debts to that I could never hope to repay. I think of my parents, godly parents. <coughs> they introduced me to the Lord. I prayed to accept the Lord as my personal Savior on the gold couch. It'll tell you I was in the 70s, right? <laughs> My dad telling me about Christ and what he did. I prayed to accept the Lord as my Savior. Five years old. I'm indebted to that. I could never hope to repay that. I have godly grandparents. Pastored all kinds of churches around this area. All the way from Houghton Lake, Michigan. All the way out to California for a few years. I can remember being in their midst, thinking my grandpa could never sin. <laughs> Such a wonderful guy. I'm indebted to Pastor Rose, Temple Baptist Church. That's where I was on a missions trip when I felt God calling me to go to the ministry, be a youth pastor. I have people like Paul Shingledecker in my life. He encouraged me. And at times, he's held me spiritually accountable. I'm indebted to my wife for her friendship, her love, her support, her wisdom, her input, her correction at times, her convictions. I'm indebted to my children. They've seen the worst of me. They still love me, even in my weakness. Their kindness, their concern, their care for their father, for their mother, their dutiful response to things that I ask of them. I'm indebted to friends, to co-workers, people that work here in the church. I'm indebted to you guys, the congregation, your prayers, for me, for my family. I could never repay those. Your wisdom, your fellowship. You even paid my wages for 16 years. You will receive your payment from God. He's the only one that can do it. I can never repay you for those things. By the way, someone owe you something financially on this earth don't worry about it. God will take care of it all. God will repay you eternally. Eternal rewards go forever. And moth and rust cannot decay it. Can I then, who owe so much to so many, could never repay? How can I not forgive? And that's what Paul says to Philemon. You owe so much. Be willing to forgive. Secondly, recognize I can become a blessing to others. Look at verse number 20. Yea, brother. So again, this is Paul writing. He calls Philemon brother. This is a great word of endearing. I love you. You're my brother. We have a common faith. Let me, 
The, the, the word me here and the word my in the Greek is emphatic. So he says, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. You know, you know what Paul is really saying here? He's saying, listen, Philemon, you have been a tremendous blessing to everybody around you. I've never gotten to get in on your blessings. So let me and my do what? Let me have joy in thee as you forgive Onesimus, not just for what he has done, but even the physical things on this earth, as you forgive, let me have the joy. Let me join in on that. And then he says, let my bowels be refreshed in the Lord. Remember, we talk about bowels. That's really talking about your heart, right? It's your emotions. Let me have this joy, this excitement. Let me join in with it. Everybody else has gotten to experience that from you, Philemon. Now it's my turn. Boy, is he tugging at the heartstrings. <laughs> I, and can you imagine being Philemon reading this? If you didn't want to forgive to begin with, you're starting to get it that I really have no option here, right? <laughs> but Paul still says, if you're going to be that way, I will repay it. And Paul means it. It's not an empty thing that he is saying. Look at verse 21. Having confidence in thy obedience. You know what we're called to do? You want to know another reason why we should be forgiving? Verse number 21, obedience. I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. He says, because you are an obedient person, and because you know the theology of forgiveness, and because you have the right heart attitude, and you're the type of person that forgives, as we saw in verses 4 through 7, I know you're not only going to forgive and forgive like I've asked you to, but you're going to do more. Well, what's the more? I don't know. He's giving Philemon the opportunity of thinking of other ways to forgive and do for Onesimus. And he's already asking Onesimus to be forgiven of the debts and then to be received not as a slave, but as a fellow brother and as a fellow laborer then in the church. And so once you do all those things, you're also going to do something else. I know it. <laughs> wow. The fourth motivation we have here is found in verse 22. And it's to recognize I am accountable to godly leaders. So number one was recognizing you have a debt you can't pay. Number two recognizing that you become a blessing to others. Number three was being obedient. Number four is recognizing I'm accountable to godly leaders. And it's a verse 22. But with all, prepare me also a lodging. So he says, get ready. I'm going to come. And then he asks them to do something very important. Look at what he says here. For I trust that through your prayers, I shall be given unto you. Start praying. I'm in jail right now. Start praying. Your prayers are going to get me out of jail. And I'm going to come and see. You know what's going to happen when I get there and I see? I'm going to have great joy to see all the forgiveness that you've done. And I'm going to see how you've gone beyond what I've even asked you to do. I'm going to be eternally blessed from what you're going to do. But if I get there and you haven't done any of that, I'll repay the debt. So I'm coming. Imagine the pressure put on Philemon here. If Paul never gets to go and show up there and Philemon hasn't prayed for it, 
<laughs> Finally, you might say, well, he's the reason Paul, uh, that Paul's still in jail. It's my fault because I didn't pray about it. You know what this also means? Paul knows the power of prayer. I know God knows everything that's going to happen. In his foreknowledge, he knows what's going to happen. But I, I believe that that wraps into it. He knows if you're going to pray about something or not. Your prayers move God. There's no doubt about it. Some people say, well, I'm not even going to pray because God's sovereign and he knows what he's doing and it's going to happen whether I pray or not. That's not true. They would not, we would not have prayer listed in the Bible if it amounted to nothing. Jesus would not have taught the disciples how to pray if it meant nothing. Paul would not have asked Philemon to pray if it meant nothing. The effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. That verse would not be there if it meant nothing. But God, I've talked about how the awesome God we have. Our God is so awesome, he knows if you're going to pray, and he knows what you're going to pray about. So he does know what the end result is going to be, but it's still your prayer that motivates God's heart to do it. I don't understand it. <laughs> we'll get to heaven, we'll understand how that works. Right now, my, my brain is affected by sin. I can't figure it out. But I know this, prayer works. I'll give you a fifth element here. Found in verse 23 through 24. It is to recognize I am not alone. I'm part of a fellowship. But withal, prepare me also. Look, verse 23. There salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner. So we have a guy by the name of Epaphras. He's in jail right now with Paul. So he's his fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. He's not a prisoner of Rome, by the way. He's a prisoner of Christ Jesus, right? Christ Jesus is allowing it. They have a tremendous ministry there in Rome while they're in prison. God has said it so. Then he talks about Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. So he says, listen, I'm part of a fellowship here. I have people who are helping me. Epaphras is helping me. All these other guys are helping me. We, we fellowship together. You are needed in fellowship. Why should you forgive someone that you go to church with? Because our fellowship is needed. And if you're unwilling to forgive, and you show up together, and there's this tension between you and that person in church, we're not going to fellowship. We're going to be in cliques. We're going to hate each other. There's no way for us to worship as a congregation. Be willing to forgive. You're part of a fellowship. Then we sharpen each other when we're here. Last thing, finally, fifth motivation recognize that I must be empowered by the grace of God. Look at verse 25. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. You know, he's, you know what he's saying there? You're going to do this. I know it. Why? Because verses 4 through 7, you're the type of person that does forgive. You know the theology. You're a spiritually motivated person. And because I know you're going to forgive, guess what I also know? The grace of God is going to be with you. You are not going to forgive if you don't have the grace of God. Only through the power of the Holy Spirit, only through God's power are you going to forgive. You are not going to do it on your own. Our natural tendency, what the world does, is to hate and seek vengeance. And if you don't believe it, just look at our world today. <laughs> it's all about unforgiveness and vengeance. No matter where you go. And I, I know I, I hit on it all the time, but road rage is just a sign of unforgiveness. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. And, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. We're becoming more unforgiving wherever we go. Don't be like that. That's not the believer's life. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this lesson you've given to us. I know it's hard I don't like to preach on forgiveness because it means I have to forgive that. But you've called us to it. It's sinful when I don't forgive. Father, may I truly be willing to see the things that happen around me. May I truly be willing to forgive. May I forgive the way that you have called me to. And Father, then when I uh, hurt somebody, may I be willing to ask for forgiveness. Truly mean it. Seek restitution. Father, I pray that as we go through our world and as we come together here as a congregation, we recognize the need to forgive. And as we do that, we become closer together as a fellowship. And we fellowship in you as our head. 
And as we do that, we just truly allow you to lead. Father, I pray that as we do that, that we have tremendous unity here. And that when people come into our midst, they feel it, they see it, they understand it, they want to be part of it. Father, we ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, we do have a closing song. Oh, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. That is 363. 363. Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. First and last stanza. Thank you.